some people like to collect photographs. Some people like to collect baseball cards. Some people like to collect old cars. Some people like to collect airplanes. We're at the Air Heritage Museum here at the Beaver County Airport in western Pennsylvania. And we want to learn about air heritage. So let's talk with the vice president of the organization, Tammy Peterson. Tammy, what is air heritage? What does it mean? Air heritage is a nonprofit organization consisting of volunteers that are uh, here to restore and promote aviation history and restore uh, vintage aircraft. This, this uh, hangar is filled with airplanes. Uh, are these all older planes? Uh, how, how far back does it go? Yes, we do have many older planes. Uh, we have military as well as some civilian planes. Uh, the oldest plane we have uh, is actually located behind us. It's a 1943 C-47. And are all these planes restored when you get them originally? First of all, where do you get them? And then how much restoration is necessary? Well, as an air museum, uh, we uh, are able to get many of these planes uh, as part of government surplus. And uh, so we have actually taken some of these planes out of the boneyard in Arizona. Uh, the plane behind us, we actually acquired from the state of Florida. Is this all volunteer work here? It is all volunteer work, yes. Uh, we have uh, 280 some members and we have a smaller group that are dedicated uh, to restoring these planes, uh, donating upwards to about 1,200 hours a month uh, in restoration projects. There seems to be a real emotional attachment to these planes among the members and the people who volunteer here. Uh, have many of them served in the, in the Air Force or the Air Corps or in the military and flown some of these planes? Uh, yes, yes we do. We have pilots and uh, mechanics as well uh, that have served uh, in the Air Force uh, or other branches of the service. They um, also uh, are enthusiastic because they love being part of that history and like any man they love working with their hands so it gets them involved in being able to restore something that's significant and has a history. So these people are really zealots they really love airplanes and they love vintage airplanes what about the general public this is after all a museum uh, do people come from various places around the country? Yes yes we do we have uh, many people that come from the region uh, and on a regular basis not just the volunteers but the general public as well but we also have foreign visitors uh, there are aviation enthusiasts the world over that will travel to museums throughout the United States uh, just to take pictures and to catalog history. Can all of these planes fly? Uh, we have a total of eight planes. Uh, currently five of them are in flyable condition. And they're made in flyable condition since they came here? or? are some flyable when they get here? Well, uh, we have a few planes in flyable condition, some civilian aircraft, but the C-47 behind me was in flyable condition, but it has been restored to its previous glory. The 123, C-123 you'll see later, uh, it was brought into the hangar and it, it was uh, a project, restoration project of about 24 months. Tammy, if people need more information, more specific information about Air Heritage, how can they get it? Uh, Larry, I would suggest that they go to our website. We have information on all of our aircraft as well as the, uh, the history of the museum, and uh, that would be a good place to start. We encourage the public to come out and visit us here at the Beaver County Airport. Our hangar is located here, and uh, we're open Monday through Saturday, and we would love to have the public come and, and see the planes we have. Tammy, thanks very much. You're welcome, Larry. Now it's time for us to take a look at some of those planes we've been talking about and get a closer view of what's here at the hangar at Air Heritage in Beaver County. Let's find out about the planes that are in this hangar here at Air Heritage. The museum is a fascinating operation and right behind us is just one of the planes and with us is uh, Dave Matthews. He gives tours a lot. He loves planes. Dave, uh, it's good to talk with you. Tell us about the plane right behind us. Well, this plane right behind us is a C-47. It was made back in 1943. Uh, it went to Europe for World War II, but it didn't get there in time for the invasion. It, didn't fly not, it did not fly in the invasion. It did fly in Operation Varsity, 
which was probably the largest airborne invasion ever. It flew in the Battle of the Bulge. This particular plane flew two resupply missions into Bastogne when they were surrounded by the Germans. On one of those missions, it was damaged by small arms fire. That tells us that it must have been low enough to make sure the Americans got their supplies to be hit by rifle and machine gun fire from the ground. Well, when this plane came into your possession, what condition was it in? It was flyable. Uh, they last used it in Florida for spraying a mosquito killer. Uh, it was used several years down there to spray. Uh, some of the counties have a, a real bad problem with mosquitoes. The government has a program to kill the mosquitoes by spraying chemicals. And this was used in that, in that position the last that was used. How did you get the plane? How did you, how did you, how did you buy it or acquire it? Well, the, the government declared it surplus. And being a nonprofit museum, uh, we have a chance at getting surplus equipment like that before the, the general public does. Is that in flyable condition right now? Uh, well, it hasn't, it hasn't actually flown in five years. But we have had the engines running here all oh, six months ago. Do you have uh, mechanics uh, available, people who can work on these planes and get them back into shape? Uh, yes, we do. We have uh, retired mechanics from U.S. Air. Uh, they still have their license. They can do the work. They can sign it off. It makes the FAA happy when they see a logbook with signatures in it. Let's talk about some of the other planes. What's the oldest plane here at the hangar? Uh, probably the Fairchild 24. It was made in 1936. It was used in uh, World War II to patrol our coast for German submarines. Uh, it's a complete restoration found from the bare, the bare metal. Uh, we'll be covering both the fuselage and the wings with polyfiber. It's a fabric material, uh, better than the old Irish linen that they used to use. Over in the far corner, I understand there's a, there's a, a Spitfire, a, a British Spitfire being constructed? Yes, there is. Uh, it's not actually owned by the museum, but one of our members is renting that corner of the hangar. Now, they made these out of aluminum to begin with. Uh, Jack said he can work with wood better than he can with aluminum. So he bought the plans that tells him how to do it out of wood. He's making the pieces. He's putting it together. Is he making the engine, too? Uh, no. The engine is an Allison engine. Uh, originally, they were Rolls-Royce engines, but those engines are too expensive now and harder to find parts for. Do you have any jets here? None that fly. We have uh, two military jets. Uh, we have an F-15 uh, Eagle and an F-4C Phantom. Uh, these are both static displays here. We have a British jet trainer uh, called a Provost. It's also on display here. It does not fly. Now, you know the history of some of these planes or these kind of planes. Which wars were many of them participating in? Uh, well, the uh, 47 here beside us would be a World War II. Uh, the Fairchild would be a World War II plane. Uh, of course, the British, uh, British jet uh, Spitfire would be a World War II plane. Uh, we have a Vietnam airplane, that, uh, the F-4, and probably the F-15 is also late Vietnamese. Now, I understand that you have a training device over here, uh, some kind of a trainer to train pilots how to fly? Uh, well, it wasn't to train them how to fly so much as to train them how to use the instruments when they're flying. Uh, back in the early 30s when this uh, was designed, uh, the pilots uh, who were experienced thought they knew more than any, any kind of thing on the dash could tell them. And it was hard to convince them to pay attention to the instruments. This would teach them how and let them train on it to get experience with it. Now this is an air museum, an airplane museum, and the earliest airplane was the Wright Brothers plane. I see there's a model of that over there. Where did that come from? Uh, that was made by some students, some high school students in Shaler Area High School. Uh, it was uh, donated to the museum when they were finished with it. Now coming in here, we notice there are some planes outside. Can you tell us which one they are? Uh, that's the F-15 Eagle. That's the first one you've seen. An F-4 Phantom is right next to it. Coming around the building, we have a uh, C-123 provider. Uh, and then we have the uh, OV-1 Mohawk and the British uh, jet trainer.
Can you tell us something about those plains and their significance in some of the conflicts we've been in? Well, the uh, F-4 Phantom was used in uh, Vietnam uh, a good bit in that era. Uh, the uh, Phantom was, or the uh, F-15 was a late Vietnam era type plane. Uh, the 123 was used in Vietnam. They sprayed Agent Orange with, with that type of plane, one of their big jobs. The other one was moving cargo and troops. Uh, the OV-1 Mohawk, it was used back in Vietnam all the way up into the uh, first Gulf War. Do you ever find uh, uh, something about the history of the planes or the pilots who flew those planes? Do you have any information about some of that? Well, I can tell you about the 47, this is our newest plane. Uh, the pilot's name was Fromm, F-R-O-M-E. Uh, we have a lot of information about him. And as a matter of fact, we contacted him once we got the plane. We found he was still alive down in Arizona. He was hard of hearing, so it was hard to communicate with him. But uh, about three months after we found him, he up and died on us. So we couldn't really pick his mind as much as we would like to have picked his mind. Let me ask you about your interest here. Uh, why are you volunteering here? What's your association with aircraft? Ah, uh, well, like I tell everybody, I had an itch back in the early 70s. I got my private pilot's license. I uh, took all my relatives and family up and showed them Beaver County several times. And uh, Then what do you do with it? Well, I, I gave it up and went into boating. <laughs> but when I retired, I needed something to do to keep me busy and occupy my time, and I decided to come over here and I've been here now five years. There's an awful lot to see in this museum. When somebody comes in, will they know what they're looking at and what to look for? Uh, well, I'll tell them what to look for if they come in and I get a hold of them. Uh, it's it, uh, discouraging sometimes because sometimes you tell somebody about a plane and then you find out that he's a pilot and he flew this plane and he, he could tell you a few things about it. Do many former pilots come here? Yes, we have, uh, we have quite a few people come through that uh, aviation related. We haven't talked about everything in this hangar. Are there some things that you'd like to point out that we haven't mentioned yet? Uh, well, we have a picture hanging on a wall over there that depicts the B-25 that crashed into the Monongahela River back in 1956. This is the one they can't find. Uh, the secret is that they pulled it out of the river with a crane the very next day. That's why they can't find it now, and it's a big mystery. <laughs> Well, we hear every once in a while somebody thinks they found where it went down. Yes, and every once in a while somebody will get a permit from the government to dredge the river looking for it. And they've never found it? Never found it. Can you imagine that? And that's a, that's a big piece of machinery. Uh, well, it's a, a twin-engine plane, bomber. It's a small river, a big plane. It's only in about 20 or 30 feet of water, maybe. Of all the planes that we've talked about here and all the planes in this hangar, uh, which are the ones that seem to interest most of the visitors that come through this museum? Well, we have a, uh, I guess you would call it a mock-up. It's a, uh, a Cessna 172 that's been cut down. The wings taken off, the tail's taken off. Uh, we have steps so the kids can go up into it. They like to get up in there and be the pilot. That's probably the one that interests most of the people. <laughs> Now, the most noticeable plane outside is a huge four-engine plane. Uh, tell us about that, the one that's right outside this hangar. Uh, you were talking about the C-123 provider. Uh, it was made back in 1956. Uh, they used these, this type of plane in Vietnam an awful lot. But uh, this particular 123 has never left the country. Well, I think it's time for us to go outside and take a look at that plane and take a closer look to see just what you've just been talking about. Thanks very much for having us into your museum. Uh, we appreciate you coming. Thank you. Here's the plane we were just talking about, the, the C-123, and Bill Schillig is the pilot. He's taken this to air shows. He was a pilot for many years in the Air Force. Bill, tell us a little bit about this plane. Is there, is there some kind of a history that might be interesting? Oh, yes. This was a real workhorse in Vietnam. It uh, flew many missions over there. It flew in the short fields, dirt strips, gravel strips, and it also performed that Agent Orange mission in Vietnam. There was uh, quite a few of them shot down, about 20 or 30 of them. And when the uh, Vietnam War ended, they sent all these airplanes back to the States and they went to various reserve units. Uh, it's interesting to me that there are still some 
prop-driven planes being used, and even in Vietnam, which was not that many years ago, I thought all planes were jets. Well, there's uh, quite a few jets nowadays, but they, the 130, which kind of took over for the 123, it can't go into quite the short fields that the 123 can, but it's a, what they call a turboprop. It's a jet engine with a prop on the front. It's got big four-engine turboprop. What's the major purpose of this plane? Major purpose was to get into short fields uh, with troops or with cargo, drop it off and then take off and go back home again, or to go into a short field and pick up troops to get them away from hostile territory. We could also airdrop supplies out of the back end of this airplane, and we could also airdrop troops. How many troops could fit into this plane? It could hold 60 troops and about 50 paratroopers. When you fly this plane, is it much different from flying all the other planes you've flown in all your years of piloting? Well, they're all, every airplane you fly is different. Like when I flew the EC-121s, when I first got off pilot training, it was a big four-engine reciprocating airplane, and it was uh, fairly complicated. This airplane is fairly simple. It ha does have two reciprocating engines, and when they had the jets added to it, that kind of complicated things, and you had to really work with both engines, both types of engines. Well, you said this is a simple plane to fly, but I look into the cockpit and see 50, 60, 70 different dials. What are they all for? Oh, there's uh, all kinds of things. There's a bunch of instruments for the uh, engines themselves, and there's cow flap switches and oil cooler switches and all that kind of stuff, plus the radios. So there's a dial for everything? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Then there's a lever for everything. There's a lever for the props. There's the t levers for the mixture controls and levers for the th throttles. Let's go back to the beginning. You started off in the Air Force in pilot training. What year would that have been? That was in 1967. Did you find it simple to get into pilot training? I know a lot of people go into the Air Force and that's all they want to do and very few people make it. What, what uh, attributes did you have to get you into pilot training? Well, I uh, majored in math, and they like pilots or beginning, beginning pilots to have a background in science and math. And uh, that was during the Vietnam War, and they were really short on pilots. So they took just about everybody that had the uh, college education in those kind of fields. Had you ever flown a plane before you got into the Air Force? No, I did not. So you're starting from scratch. How do they teach a young flyer or flyer-to-be to, to fly a plane? Oh, they start out just like you would as a private pilot over here in one of these uh, schools. They start you out in a Cessna 172. They called it a T-41 in the Air Force, but it's basically a Cessna 172, a single-engine prop airplane. And you, once you get through that type training, then they start training you into uh, T-37s, which was a two-engine jet, and then the T-38, which was a high-performance jet. Did you find it difficult to learn what you had to to become a pilot? Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I had a little bit of a hard time getting through some of those, uh, some of those training programs. What was the most interesting plane that you've flown in all these 50-something years? All the airplanes are a little bit different. You had different experiences. I guess the EC-121, where I took it to Vietnam and to Iceland and a few other places, that, and you had a big crew on there on board the EC-121. It took a lot of coordination. I kind of like flying a crew airplane, you know, most people that go into the Air Force to be a pilot, they want to be a jet pilot, a fighter pilot. But uh, that's what I wanted to do too, but they didn't put me in those. But once I got into a crew type airplane, I really enjoyed those. Were you in any kind of a, a dangerous situations as a pilot? Well, over Vietnam, there was always the danger of getting shot at really no other dangerous situations. Of course, you, all airplanes have emergencies occasionally, which 
you're trained to handle. Tell us a little bit more about this plane right here. Tell us what uh, their capacity is and tell us about the flying conditions and tell us about how you had it get this ready for your next air show. Well, this airplane takes quite a bit of work, but we have some volunteers that uh, take tender love and care of the darn thing. It's, uh, it's old, it was built in 1954, but these engines are really reliable. We, uh, we can haul up to uh, 54,000 pounds is what we uh, had in the Air Force, a gross weight of 54,000 pounds. And you can haul, like we said before, 60 troops or 50 paratroopers or all kinds of cargo, anything that would fit through the big ramp and door in the bag. Are there many of these planes still around? Right now, this is the only one that's still flying. The only one of its kind. How did you get this to start with? Well, we got it through a government surplus program. I wasn't with Air Heritage when they acquired this airplane, but uh, a guy by the name of Talashe purchased some airplanes and he offered them to different museums in exchange for some of the revenue we could uh, get by taking the airplane to air shows. And we had an agreement that after 20, 30 years, the airplane became Air Heritage's exclusively, so it's all our airplane now. Is this a, a difficult airplane to service because after all it's so many years old? Well, in a way it is, and in other ways it isn't because it, the cowling on this airplane opens up better than most reciprocating engines, it makes it easy to get to the engine to work on it. And uh, the R2800, which is on this airplane, the reciprocating engine, is still being used by other airplanes, so it's pretty easy to get parts for the, for the engines themselves. How many air shows do you do a year? Well, they've been slowly declining. Last year we did about 12. This year we've got five or six scheduled right now, and we hope to pick up at least 10. Maybe some of us don't understand what an air show is and what the purpose of an air show is. Maybe tell us about one that you can remember right at the moment. Uh, what was it like and where did you go? Oh, well, we went down to Dobbins Air Force Base in Georgia for an air show. And people fly their airplanes in like we do and put them on display for the public to be able to walk through them and. Uh, see what the airplane looks like and they ask questions about how they operate and what they did. And what's neat about some air shows is we get uh, Vietnam vets that used to fly in the back of the airplane when they were getting hauled from place to place and they have to come in and tell us their stories about what they experienced when flying in the 123. I would imagine that because jets are so sleek and so modern looking that most of the interest would be in that direction. Is that not true? Well, it varies, but at a lot of air shows, we get a big line at, in the back of our airplane of people that want to go through it and, uh, and see it from the inside. When, you, when, when you're planning to go to an air show, do you have to do something special, or is each show about the same? Each show is about the same. We take uh, about eight people with us to every show. We set up a PX, which uh, three or four people run, and the rest of us give the tours through the airplane. Now, I know this is a nonprofit organization. The Air Heritage Museum is probably always looking for money. And I'm sure that's one, one source of funds would be those air shows. Are people pretty generous, mostly? Yes, they are. Uh, we get quite a bit of money through the back door. We ask for a donation with people that come through. But also, when we go to these air shows, the air show will pay for the fuel that it takes to get there and get back, which is quite an expense because this thing burns 200 gallon an hour. And they also given us what they call an appearance fee. If you have a problem with this plane because it's so old, even though it's well maintained, uh, are there some places you can go? Suppose you're uh, 10,000 feet up or whatever the altitude is, and you suddenly find yourself between here and where you're going. Uh, how do you find a place to go? Oh, there's a lot of airports around. You know, we we fly with a GPS, and you just push 
push a button, it tells you where the nearest airport is, and if you got to put it down, you can find one pretty close. Bill, I understand that you're a movie star. <laughs> <laughs> that there was a movie made using this plane? Yes, uh, the, the, the movie came out just last year. It was called American Maid, starring Tom Cruise. We flew down to Canton, Georgia to do the filming, and Tom was uh, supposedly a drug runner, and he used this airplane to fly drugs around the South America. Was it pretty interesting making a movie with Tom Cruise? Oh yeah, it was really interesting. He turned out to be one heck of a nice guy. And he's a good pilot too. I had him in the left seat during Cruise flight, and he actually flew the airplane. My guess is he never saw this kind of a plane or certainly has not flown this kind of an airplane before. Was it difficult to teach him how to fly it? No, it wasn't. It, uh, he was a pretty good pilot, so he was able to hold it steady. <laughs> Were you in the movie? No. <laughs> My left hand might have been in the movie because <laughs> I was playing with the throttles. Bill, this is interesting. I'm so glad that you all invited us out here to see the uh, Air Heritage Museum here in Beaver Falls. And I'm hoping that um, one day we'll get to see you at an air show. Thanks very much for having us out. All right. Well, thank you for coming. Airplanes have always been a fascination, for me anyway, and maybe for you as well. That's why we came to the Air Heritage Museum here at the Beaver Falls Airport. I'm Larry Berg. We'll see you next time on Faces and Places. Music